two years ago and three years ago when i try to pen something on the topic of judicial reformation that book itself was having the title rethinking judicial reforms with a subtitle reflections from uh, indian legal system when one of my colleagues in delhi uh, ha had the book in her hand and went to invite uh, one of the uh, judges of the supreme court for the release function who really actually honored it uh, and came for the function then before the formalities for getting the appointments and all a registrar in the supreme court was staring at the title of the book rethinking judicial reforms and asked this question to my uh, colleague who went to meet the judge that do you think do you still think that this is something possible within the judiciary namely reforms she said probably presumably in the affirmative because at any rate the title of the book required to be honored and the lesson that it uh, rather passes is that so many people within the judiciary probably uh, still believe that the system is you know very conventional very orthodox and it is not very prone to reforms of any kind this is why probably franz kafka said in his classic work the trial uh, somewhere in the trial that lawyers seem to him as a category who is very much you know who is very much uh, uh, disinclined towards the uh, reform process and they never thought it fit to have any kind of reformation within the judicial system this was this is an old story and probably the story doesn't change much even after a you know, long long period but still we need to address the issues because the issues are real the issues are not imaginary and we will have to undergo the process therefore when these young students of law young lawyers are before me now this is more a situation where your dreams on the one hand you know confronting with uh, my memories on the other so confrontation between your imagination and my uh, memories or rather my experience uh, who had been for the last 30 years or more in the bar but the, i would say that we need to uh, uh, understand the issues the michel foucault one said justice must always question itself just as society can exist only by means of the work it does on itself and on its institutions so judicial institution you no know, is is a system which we will have to have a close watch on persistently because the institutional framework right from the process of appointment to the uh, levels of judicial discipline judicial behavior judicial accountability all matters uh, when we carry out the profession when the society depends upon us when the society depends upon the uh, judicial institution on the court therefore i would uh, suggest that we need to have a clear perspective on institutional reforms uh, professionalism uh, should not be taken as something antithetical to the uh, question of reforms though it is often taken in that way we need to ultimately understand that the professionalism even can thrive on only when the institutional uh, 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 parameters are properly laid down and fulfilled so with this a uh, short uh, prefatory uh, note i would come to the a uh, team, team uh, which is now allotted to me namely the reality and the rhetoric parts of the judiciary in this country which is of course a very broad very abstract topic therefore for the, for the sake of convenience i will just try to divide it into into essentially four categories and i will have a very quick uh uh examination of all these four categories 
Uh, first, I will try to talk, indicate some uh, uh, reflections about uh, judicial democracy in India. Secondly, which is uh, at the second point, I will tell something about uh, judicial federalism, uh, which we are, we all aspire, and which we uh, and the aspirations uh, which are founded es essentially in the constitutional framework, which is part of the former theme, named the first theme, namely the judicial democracy. And thirdly, I will try to uh, talk something about uh, the quality of judicial deliberations within and outside the uh, judicial institution, especially the court. And uh, also as the fourth uh, subtitle, I will uh, try to make a reference to the, uh, uh, the plight and the, uh, the present phase of the legal profession. These are the four uh, broad areas uh, which will give a kind of foundation for our reflections today so that we will be able to deliberate more into the, the, uh, the minute uh, parts of this issue in the time to come, even after the webinar is over. Regarding judicial democracy, I would suggest uh, that the, so much of discussions have taken place in the country, especially until the NJIC judgment. The very fact that after Justice Kurian Joseph, uh, stated about the requirement to have a glasnost and perestroika in Indian judicial system. And when opinions were called for, for reforms, suggestions were called for from people across the country, the court, the Supreme Court itself acknowledged on the subsequent uh, date before the final NJAC judgment that there were about uh, suggestions running into some uh, uh, 16 thousand pages. That was the kind of, kind of uh, involvement with not just lawyers of this country were having in the uh, uh, topic of appointment process. Because I believe personally, and even professionally for that matter, that majority of the issues with respect to Indian judiciary uh, have direct linkage with our appointment process you have a faulty system of appointment in the country. You don't have an independent commission, which, ensure, which alone probably ensures an independent judiciary. Uh, we have developed, of course, uh, during the SP Gupta uh, period, it was the political executive, which was having domination in the selection and appointment process by giving a literal meaning to uh, articles uh, 124 and 217 of the constitution dealing with the appointment to the Supreme Court and the High Courts respectively. A literal view was taken where the president was having the ultimate say, meaning thereby that the executive had the final say in the process of selection and appointment. Then as all of us are aware of, in 1993, in the second judge's case, uh, filed by the Supreme Court Advocates on Record Association, the Supreme Court evolved a new system of collision, which was subsequently clarified in the third judge's case in 1998, giving a further shape and structure to the collegium, defining collegium as the senior most members of the uh, 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 Supreme Court bench, uh, judges, senior most judges of the Supreme Court bench. And we have been following that. And in 1998, uh, a new system also was evolved, which was uh, vaguely, but uh, repeatedly called as memorandum of procedure, which doesn't find a place in the constitution at all for that matter. Memorandum of procedure was actually a kind of uh, a, a, a terminology, a phrase which indicated the process of exchange of ideas, suggestions, et cetera, et cetera, between the judiciary and the executive, which didn't have uh, any transparency at any point of time for that matter. That ensured the secret nature of the appointment process, the consultations, the nominations, the uh, verification of antecedents, 
everything always remained in the oblivion uh, so that the general public didn't have any access to the process of appointment. I would suggest that access to justice should mean in theory and in practice access to the appointment process as well. Unless and until you have a transparent process of selection and appointment, say by way of an independent commission as it occurs in the UK, where the 15 member committee does the job, chaired by uh, sometimes even by a lay person, not uh, even by a lawman or lawwoman necessarily, and which is having the representative character, having persons from the other uh, geographic areas like Scotland or Ireland. And that seems to be a good model, of course, uh, which will not be subjected to the Indian conditions. Then you are having the uh, uh, system of, of having discourse, deliberations in the, in the legislative uh, body regarding the nominations, where there is you know, better transparency uh, in the selection process is ensured. You all remember what happened when the Sonia Maria Sotomayor was uh, nominated, was suggest, her name was suggested as an associate judge of the US Supreme Court and the, how the Senate discussed about it, about her antecedents, about her speech, uh, uh, which uh, she delivered long, long years, uh, years ago and all. And there are systems of open interview which of the, uh, the candidates. We live in a country where you come to know about the judge in the constitutional court, whether the high court or high courts or in the Supreme Court on a fine morning. Uh, we do not know, that, as people, we do not know uh, as to how the selection occurred, what was the procedure, and how the uh, track records were actually verified and measured. We are not interested. Our political parties are not interested. Our legal bodies are not interested. Uh, fraternity, even for that matter, is not interested. This is a, a very terrible situation. Therefore, it so happens that this uh, process of appointment, which often is uh, reflective of uh, secret kind of consultations, which are more in the nature of lobbying and all. Even lobbying should be a process which should have a uh, 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 openness, and even that should have a kind of, you know, uh, principled uh, methodology, which the country terribly lacks in the, uh, uh, in the in the process. So this is a this is really a concern. The pro the question therefore is to how to democratize the the process of selection and appointment, and that alone probably understand until we address that issue, we won't be in a position to have a better level of judicial democracy in the country. So once you set right the selection process with an independent commission and with more transparency, which really assess the uh, legal and moral merit of the candidates, then the other problems will at least get diluted. The gravity of the other problems like uh, the question of judicial behavior, judicial discipline, judicial accountability and all. These are all, you know, once you select the better persons, uh, better who, are, who could act as better guarantee uh, uh, for the uh, performance on and off the bench, then the other uh, issues get, you know, the, the gravity at least gets diluted. But uh, still, we need to address even, unless we cannot wait till we select uh, the, the change the whole system. Now the conflict between the National Judicial Appointment Commission, NJSC on the one hand, and Collegium on the other hand, stands resolved by the NJSC judgment of the Supreme Court, which in effect just reiterated the Collegium system, which uh, didn't uh, go for the uh, so-called glasnost or perestroika, which the court itself through Justice Joseph was once you know, uh, uh, telling about. Now we have gone back to the pre-NJAC judgment uh, era uh, with the so-called memorandum of procedure. This memorandum of procedure, I would say, again, you know, that implies, uh, as I said, the invisible uh, kind of exchange of suggestions and consultations, which should not have been invisible for that matter. And that also in, in another way, you know, that uh, uh, hampers, that damages the independence of judicial. 
Though, so therefore, unlike uh, so many uh, people believe, the one city is a collegian system, there is a total independence. Now, he's, I would say it's a, it's, a, it's a wishful thinking because of this uh, uh, factor, namely the memorandum of procedure. By memorandum of procedure, communications between the uh, executive on the one hand and judiciary or the collegium on the other occurs. And very often things get decided based on uh, intelligence reports. And uh, an honorable judge of the Supreme Court who recently retired said that these IB reports are often manipulated for one reason or other, or with one motive or other. So this happens. So we don't have a foolproof system at all. So it's a very uh, defective system, uh, which will have to be set right. And I don't think that this uh, appointment commission collegium uh, binary will be uh, resolved in the near future. But at least certain changes, like you know, in the given in the existing parameters, one the the center would do well to consider at least in, as regarding the high courts, uh, if uh, judges of one particular uh, uh, state's high court are appointed from other jurisdictions, so that uh, the court will be able to you know get better uh, people from outside rather than choosing the intimate persons who are known to one another, who may have their you know. Uh, uh, feelings and uh, knowledge with, on account of familiarity or on account of associations, etc., within the uh, uh, particular high court. I, I would therefore suggest that even without a radical change, a fundamental change, it, the, the court will uh, uh, do well if the superficial change, which I would say, of, uh, of finding out judges uh, from outside the jurisdiction of a particular high court for that high court may make slight variation because for due to lack of familiarity. And once you do that properly with the proper merit assessment and you know the assessment of the uh, moral personality of the person and all, slight change may occur. But ultimately, for betterment of judicial democracy, I would suggest that there has to be an independent commission uh, uh, for selection and appointment, which alone will be able to ensure the, uh, the quality of judicial uh, democracy. Then Shan was yesterday uh, asking me about the question as to uh, uh, how the chief justice of Mad the former chief justice of uh, Madras High Court uh, was dealt with in uh, during the uh, last uh, uh, phase of her career. Uh, of course, she was sought to be transferred to a, a, a northeastern state, and subsequently uh, the then chief justice Gogoi. Uh, uh, ordered some uh, CBA inquiry uh, against her. I, we do not know what happened to that. Uh, probably that was a, a gesture of displeasure uh, expressed at that time. And how that was taken uh, uh, forward is not known to anybody and the media reports also are lacking on that. But fact remains, that's my uh, next uh, point, uh, second uh, topic, that is judicial federalism. How does the Supreme Court you know, uh, assume for itself uh, this kind of uh, power which they have been uh, imposing on the high courts? Supreme Court, of course, is having appellate jurisdiction uh, under Article uh, 136 and all, but you know, the civil appeal jurisdiction or criminal appeal appellate jurisdiction is something which, as all of us know, uh, is exclusively on the judicial side. And administratively, of course, certain powers, because it's a union, uh, uh, we, are, we are having a federal system, uh, it, the Supreme Court will have to necessarily uh, uh, employ uh, certain coordinating power on the high courts. That also is quite understandable. But to treat the uh, judges of the high court who are, in fact, even constitutionally in law, uh, exercising concurrent jurisdiction, or even a larger jurisdiction, if you go by the text of Article 226, Qua, Article 32, uh, the high courts are having power to invoke jurisdiction for any other purpose, which the Supreme Court cannot invoke under Article 32. So how does the Supreme Court uh, judges or collegium for that matter invoke large powers uh, of transfer, of uh, uh, disciplinary action, of uh, inquiring, uh, of ordering an inquiry, 
investigation, etc. on the high court judge. I would say in recent times, you know, all of us know that uh, the Supreme Court has become one of the, uh, 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 not even one of the, probably the strongest political institution in the country, where all the political decisions are ultimately taken in the uh, by the Supreme Court. Every legal issues of uh, some prominence uh, arising from each and every state ultimately reaches the Supreme Court. Supreme Court gives a political verdict on that. Political verdict in the academic sense. It has a political ramification. It has a political impact. It decides the political fate of the public at large. In that way, the Supreme Court gives political judgments on all the issues. So such a, uh, a great institution, such a powerful institution, uh, that has some certain inherent centrist characters. But there was a time when the high courts were you know, equally respected and there was no intrusion into the uh, power of the jurisdiction of the, uh, uh, the power of the high court judges and their jurisdiction. Only few cases were to reach the Supreme Court. But nowadays, almost all the cases of some importance reach the Supreme Court in one way or other. And there was, a, I read uh, somewhere a few years ago, that there was a situation when the judges of the high courts were not even all uh, willing to get elevated to the Supreme Court. That was the kind of uh, power with the uh, high courts were uh, enjoying uh, till the recent past. And even in, in Chandra Kumar's case, Supreme Court itself said that the value of the high court is very important because of the wider uh, ambit and scope of 226. And also for the fact that this, uh, in this country, uh, we were having the high courts even before you know, the, the, uh, the institution of Supreme Court, even before the Supreme Court came into being. So that's the second point I would uh, shortly put the suggestion that we need to cultivate the, uh, the kind of judicial federalism which the constitution in, by several means uh, has envisaged. Uh, we need to recognize the power of the high court and the autonomy of the judges of the high court and there has to be some constitutional guard against the uh, kind of uh, 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 intrusion, even by the Supreme Court, in areas where the autonomy of the uh, high courts uh, needs to be uh, preserved, for which the uh, vigilance of legal fraternity is an imperative. Thirdly, I will uh, just talk about the question of judicial, uh, quality of judicial deliberation in this country. This again is having some connection with the two uh, subtitles which I have tried to indicate earlier. Uh, judicial, uh, just as Chandra Jude once said about the requirement to have a proper dialogue, and he used the phrase, dialogic truth. To have a dialogic truth, the quality of deliberation, uh, to what extent uh, we are able to enhance the constitutionality of the deliberations occurring in the, in the, in the courts especially in the constitutional courts. It is not just the opinions of the judges which we are expecting. The judges may have several opinions on all the issues. It is not their personal opinions which we are expecting in the form of judgments ultimately. They will have to constitutionally scan the issues. They will have to scrutinize the issues. And they will have to give a constitutional uh, assessment of the issues and decide cases fairly, justly, and in uh, tune with the constitutional provisions and other legal provisions. For that, uh, there has to be a better level of you know, uh, deliberation, which you can ensure only when the uh, uh, bench uh, and the bar are equally intellectually equipped for that. Now I find in recent times, this I think is a, is a matter which uh, should be placed in a webinar like this. We have so many brilliant minds, young minds, uh, with a lot of hopes, as uh, Shan yesterday indicated. They are capable of doing things, especially the women lawyers, uh, young girls and young women. They, are, they have a lot of potential in them. Of course, men also, the youngsters, are very, there are very serious lawyers, law students. They have, with the advanced digital uh, platforms and all, they have a better understanding of uh, the laws and constitution in uh, other jurisdictions as well. 
and they have a better concept of the constitutional values like liberty, equality, or uh, the other kinds of freedom, uh, dignity, and all. The point is whether the existing bench, conventional bench in India, is capable of having a, 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 a creative and intellectual rapport in uh, having a proper judicial dialogue with his brilliant minds in uh, the Indian judiciary. I have a strong apprehension whether they get alienated uh, because of the uh, system's inability to assimilate them, uh, to integrate them to the uh, institution by enhancing its own quality of uh, uh, judicial deliberation. Sometimes it so happens that a very detailed research uh, or a very uh, in-depth uh, study uh, done by a youngster doesn't get you know, proper uh, uh, accommodation or uh, rather the uh, kind of uh, consideration uh, by the constitutional court judges in this country. This may be, uh, there may be exceptional situations, but there is of course a real concern uh, which the institution will have to uh, seriously address in the immediate uh, future itself. As I understand until you uh, are able to make use of these brilliant youngsters and uh, uh, to create a space for them in the institution and to utilize their uh, talents for the future of the institution, uh, we may be uh, rather wasting a, a lot of a, a huge quantity of uh, human creativity, which no institution, no system can afford to have. That is the third point which I wanted to highlight. And the fourth and last um, uh, final uh, broad area is the, is the uh, uh, kind of threat or rather the situation in which uh, the legal profession has placed itself. The legal profession, of course, uh, uh, it has to, uh, in itself, this again is in a way part of the judicial democracy, the questions relating to judicial democracy. Uh, the system has, uh, has to uh, ensure that the uh, legal fraternity maintains the basic constitutional values. So as in the case of uh, judicial appointment, judicial democracy, uh, accountability and all, we need to cultivate a system where the legal the pupil the members of the legal fraternity are able to understand one another as uh, variants of uh, constitutional values and in that process the uh, constitutional values or constitutional moral values if i should be more specific like equality or uh, fraternity and all those should be preserved so there is some kind of Article 14, which uh, the variation of which we should install uh, in the in the in the fraternity, which again has been terribly lacking in the uh, uh, last uh, several uh, decades, and which the 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 question of uh, deconstitutionalization of uh, uh, fraternity's values. Uh, that is so apparent uh, in the in the recent times. The profession is very much hierarchical in the sense that you divide the lawyers as a fraternity, as ordinary lawyers, uh, uh, or uh, young lawyers, or the designated lawyers, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Which, of course, the Advocates Act uh, provides for designation of senior lawyers. There is a system of Kuhn's Council in uh, the UK. Uh, there is some uh, system resembling that in Australia. No, no one disputes that. The problem is uh, you don't have a fair mechanism of even doing that exercise. As it happens in the case of judicial uh, selection, selection of judges, the, you have some uh, parameters which are not known to others. Even after Indira Jai Singh's case, uh, decided by the Supreme Court, you are, have given some dilution with respect to the income tax and all. But fact remains, that the system doesn't, uh, is not capable, so the system is not capable of choosing the leaders of the bar, if at all the leaders are required. So you have a, uh, you have a uh, dubious, rather 
you have a secret uh, a system to, for assessment of the uh, merit uh, and assessment of other capacities uh, for being uh, designated. So this may be, one may uh, rather take it as a question of having different categories. It is much more than that. It is much, much more than that. It's not a uh, question of somebody being designated, somebody not being designated, or considering somebody for that. It's much, much more than that. It's not, not even that. The question is, the conventionally preserved sense of equality among the bar members was heavily damaged in the, in the recent past, which is, neither, uh, which is not good uh, either for the fraternity or for the institution. So we need to uh, have a, a system where you need any lawyer for that matter who comes and addresses the uh, court should be treated as far as possible with a sense of equality. Of course, lawyers will differ, human beings will differ. That kind of inequality will be always there, as uh, Dr. Ambedkar said about the economic inequality and all, which we can prob cannot probably erase. But I would suggest that the conventionally cultivated values of legal profession, uh, treating uh, one, another, one another on an equal platform and uh, giving uh, almost equal consideration for all the lawyers by the bench uh, in a, a, with a better and more ethical sense of uh, 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 or judicious uh, uh, consideration is, 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 is a, a must for the, uh, for, uh, in the task of judicial reformation. So these are the four general areas which I wanted to highlight uh, for this webinar. I don't think that I should uh, go further deep into it. Uh, these are general uh, outlines only. I, ha I know that I have not been very uh, concrete on a, uh, with respect to any particular issue. And I also know that I have just indicated the topics, not even probably elaborated on that. Now, uh, uh, for a democratic dialogue on this, I would rather uh, listen to what uh, uh, my friends here are uh, thinking about the uh, general issue so that we will develop it into a, into a discourse uh, and uh, uh, try to uh, reach a certain kind of synthesis after the thesis and the anti-thesis. Thank you. Thank you. That the other states were these persons were not permanent inhabitants uh, required to be reminded about their constitutional duty to treat them fairly. This was the, uh, there were instances where uh, these migrant laborers were uh, not identified, their flight was not documented, so that uh, there was no uh, proper control over them for the states, which even benefited enormously out of their labor. So this was indicated right during the late 70s. And this was the legislative uh, uh, background uh, in which the 79 legislation happened to be passed. But strangely, uh, one, one will understand it that even in the state of Kerala, the follow-up actions based on the legislation, including the framing of rules and all, and especially the steps for having these identity cards, uh, the, the other facilities for residents, for accommodation, for food, medical care and all, were not happening even uh, till recently. I remember that uh, a few years ago, uh, one case uh, called Rajan Kudumbatil versus State of Kerala happened to be filed in the High Court of Kerala, where the petitioner heavily relied on this uh, 79 legislation, along with another uh, statute uh, uh, by, uh, brought out by the UPA government uh, on uh, unorganized uh, uh, workers, with respect to unorganized workers. Believe me or not, the government was not even aware of the existence of the 17 And no steps uh, had been taken pursuant to that enactment as on that point of time. But Hello. the public uh, interest litigation oh, okay. report was able to take a proactive role <laughs> and <laughs> in the state with respect to its duty. Yeah, the the to to, to. And I would now think but, that that judgment uh, by a division but, bench consisting of Justice uh, Bashir and Chief Justice uh, Banur Mutt, uh, who were in the uh, public interest litigation bench at that point of time, 
issue certain directives uh, uh, whereby the state government was motivated to uh, take certain concrete steps the significance of this uh, as uh, sanley b was pointing out the significance of this judgment or probably this act is now all the more clear but for that judgment uh, the in the state of kerala also so, uh, to some extent the kind of mechanism that the state has now developed might not have uh, really happened that judgment reminded about the constitutional duties of the state government and pursuant to that judgment several steps were taken which included the identification of migrant laborers uh, the uh, fixing liability uh, liability on the contractors who brought in these laborers uh, reminding them to uh, uh, have a, uh, a register of uh, containing the names and other details of the migrant laborers so that not only for the purpose of law and order situation and all but for the fundamental purpose of uh, fulfilling their uh, constitutional uh, rights uh, namely the food shelter medicine etc and uh, for ensuring a fairer work conditions the government of kerala was in a better position unlike so many other states you don't find lot of stranded uh, laborers or uh, starving laborers uh, in the state of kerala that happened because of two things one is the enactment but that also reminds us just to have the enactment doesn't uh, is not enough yeah. as it has occurred elsewhere in the country you need to implement it and if the executive doesn't implement it it required a, a proactive uh, intervention by the state uh, often in the public interest litigation uh, uh, category uh, which exactly the high court of kerala has done with respect to migrant labor thank you uh, harsh daga has a question Uh, hello sir good evening uh, my name is harsh daga um, and uh, i paid very close attention to your talk in specific about how there is very less democratization when it comes to judicial appointments and you know elevation of practicing advocates onto the bench well and and i like the idea of the legal fraternity you know people like you and i the students the lawyers stay vigilant vis-a-vis these judicial appointments yes. but wouldn't you say that it is extremely impossible for a lawyer or even a junior judge to you know freely question the courts uh, when it comes to such matters because they have extreme all pervasive powers when it comes to you know instituting a contempt proceeding against such a person or just a simple cold shoulder when it comes to you know advocates representing their clients using matters you know in courts because like the issues like the indra jai singh issue where the supreme court was extremely visibly hostile you know against uh, the senior advocate how how does a person stay vigilant and raise questions uh, at a time like that and uh, thank you so much uh, mr harsh it's a very it's a very brilliant question it's an apprehension which is shared by many and therefore it is so vital to to think about that and to express the concern over that it was the why why the the uh, any court is kind of you know asking for a for reformation within the system of uh, judiciary as you said as you indicated is is uh, rather a, 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 a dangerous task for obvious reasons you are uh, and if you speak out if you if you uh, rebellion yourself you know for a for a betterment that is probably the reason why the lawyers were always you know uh, uh, trying to maintain the status quo in the system as kafka elamented uh, in the, in the trial but uh, i think uh, we need to understand the uh, issue in a in a uh, holistic manner this was a problem throughout you know, when griffith uh, uh, wrote about the uh, politics of the judiciary in 1977 about which the time uh, had a, a front page report rather a controversial Uh, highlighting the controversial part of griffith's work but griffith always said uh, about the the uh, inclination of the judiciary or rather its connection with the uh, uh, political uh, regime of the of the times so i would uh, suggest that reformation in judiciary uh, need to transcend the barriers of judiciary if you of course the role of lawyers is important uh, they need to have a say 
they should uh, have the courage of oppositional radicalism. But as you said, the uh, efforts should not be a kind of, you know, uh, amateur uh, activity or a, a, a dream of a, of a, uh, from the fringes. It has to have a strong, formidable, mainstream character for which you need to take the political wing also into confidence. You need to have a political ambience which thrives for reforms within judiciary, which is a very tough uh, task ahead. You know, uh, for the last several uh, years, question of judicial reforms uh, doesn't find a place uh, with more details in our uh, in the election manifestos of the political parties, though there are certain references. Of course, the uh, BJP or the uh, uh, NDA uh, under BJP or the UPA under the Congress or other political parties, including the left, they make certain references, of course, with respect, uh, uh, as regarding judicial reforms. Uh, last time, I uh, read all the uh, election manifestos. There is only a very uh, short reference, very uh, brief reference to the question of reforms without going into details in the uh, BJP's manifesto. Uh, whereas Congress uh, taught relatively in an eloquent manner about reforms. And strangely, that is a kind of reform which the Congress was never serious about while they were able to do that. You know that you, the, you want an appointment process they didn't do, and they, in fact, created the present scenario. Uh, the second judge's case and third judge's case, you will find if you read the judgments of 1993 and 1998, that the center was only uh, curious about the design of the collegium system. They were never serious about the uh, formation of an appointment commission, and much less an independent commission. Now also the political parties do not take the issue of uh, judicial reform seriously. If, then what I remains just, is legal fraternity. Uh, As regarding sir, legal fraternity. If, yeah, if I may just, even if the political party decides to bring in a system, a whole new legislation to ensure that the collegium system is done away with and a proper system, a more democratic system of appointments is put in place, the judiciary again strikes that down saying that it challenges the basic structure of the constitution. So as such, even if I have the full might of the executive behind me, it still looks like it's impossible for us to, you know, bring about a change simply because right. they have we something are, called the basic structure in their we are, favor. We are, now, we are now closer to the point. We are now closer to the point. I thank you for that. Okay. You are right. Now, the, 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 but the question is, see, once you uh, get into the track record of the Supreme Court, in whatever political fundamental issues, institutional issues, you will find that the external political ambience, as Griffith indicated in his classic work of 77, the external political ambience will have a, 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 a kind of uh, uh, a, a telling effect on the process of adjudication. Okay. This is, you find the, that is why probably uh, Professor Ubayantra Bakshi said, that we had altogether seven constitutions, depending upon the political climate. We have the constitution of 1950, we have the constitution of Nehruvian socialism, we have the constitution of national emergency, and the activist judiciary after the emergency, and the globalization constitution of the, after the 90s. So this shows, no, it is not as if, uh, the, we cannot bluntly say that whatever be the political climate, the judiciary will take. Of course, the, you, the, the, experience, the Indian experience indicate that, at least as regarding judicial appointment, what you said is correct. But I would rather uh, uh, think of going further on that. Uh, if, if the question of judicial reformation is, uh, is uh, put into the political party's agenda, and if the bar as a whole is so serious about it, we, if we are able to make our bar associations better, our fraternities better, our bar council better, uh, uh, the, which, which thrives for independence in all facets of the functions of judiciary, right from appointment process, 
there is scope for you know uh, the, the, the further hopes in that regard. We need not be so pessimistic. Of course, the experience tells otherwise. There are interest groups. See, take the example of this uh, 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 digital courts. Digital, we need to get rid of the personal, the, the, the fractioned interest, first of all, and think about the larger interest of the fraternity and the interest of the public at large, because ultimately it is meant for the people of this country, not for just, uh, just lawyers and or judges. We need to take them into confidence. They need to have the faith in this system. So what I would suggest, see, take the example of this digital cost. Digital court is a situation where you, uh, myself can sit in Kochi, yourself can uh, sit in Chennai, and someone else can uh, sit in a remote village in Kerala or Tamil Nadu or uh, Maharashtra for that matter and argue a matter before the Supreme Court. One need not travel from Chennai to Delhi for arguing for five minutes, or from Kochi to uh, Delhi for that matter, which I have done so many times, hundred times in my, in, my, in my profession, sometimes just to get a dismissal after arguing for five minutes. Is it necessary that uh, you need to go to your uh, visit physically your uh, uh, friend or relative uh, uh, staying in Ultimately, I would think that a lawyer, as I have written elsewhere, a lawyer is uh, uh, carrying out an emancipatory role by positioning herself uh, between the uh, state and the citizen. Uh, there is, you, you don't find a lot of professions carrying out that function. Even a doctor doesn't do that, an engineer doesn't do that. Of course, they will be all important in the national building process and in uh, making a welfare state. But you, as a lawyer, uh, uh, are carrying out a function, uh, is carrying out a function which only a lawyer will be able to carry out. Uh, uh, by ensuring liberty, by ensuring equality, by ensuring dignity, and by implementing the constitutional values in the in the real life of people, uh, that is something fascinating. That is uh, something that will uh, motivate us. But to effectuate it further, we need to keep uh, keep in mind that it requires reformation in the system, which will uh, 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 give us better space, better accommodation for lawyers from all backgrounds, from non-traditional backgrounds, especially. Because I am a lawyer who, who uh, personally, you know, from a non-traditional background. My daughter may not be. But I am therefore conscious of that kind of, you know, the struggle which one should uh, have in, in, in improving the system and in improving the uh, society collectively and the individual uh, personally. So this is a challenge. Therefore, I would uh, suggest the young lawyers uh, uh, as I uh, tried to indicate in the beginning. Let us be uh, 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 optimists uh, with our will. And uh, even though uh, we, because of our intellect, we are uh, often, you know, because of the experience, we are often uh, not, you know, we are, uh, not, we, we are uh, not very optimistic about it. Let us be optimistic with our will, though we may be pessimists with our uh, intellect or with given with our experience. Yes, sir. Thank you. Can I ask an another one, question? Uh, no, sorry, Tarun. Uh, we have oh, okay. uh, one last question uh, from um, uh, Mr. Bastian. I don't know how to pronounce it. Stuart? Perfectly fine. Uh, no one really. <laughs> um, so you, you spoke about judicial democracy and focused. Can't hear. <laughs> In your problem of the same day, yes, for me, yes, yes, okay. Stipulate the some representative space for the leaders of the bar as well, including the bar association, bar council, and other uh, uh, required bodies. So we can democratize that uh, allotment process also, as we need to democratize the uh, system of selection and appointment. This again may be a dream, but this is something which the legal fraternity or even the, uh, the public at large, including the civil society, political society, should uh, emphasize again and again, so that there will be a, a change, uh, at least uh, slowly, uh, hopefully. Okay. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you so much, Mr. Raj, for a really uh, illuminating and interesting talk and discussion. 
Um, I have one. I'd like to also just say thank you to a few other people um, from your side to uh, your daughter, Tulsi Raj, who's been very helpful. And from our side to uh, Tarun, who's done a lot of uh, research uh, and to